From the times of the Republic run by Oliver Cromwell to now, we have never had a written constitution that protects the people from tyranny. When King John signed the Magna Carta, limiting the power of the sovereign, followed by the Bill of Rights in 1689, which gave citizens more rights, the Reform Act in 1832, Parliament Act 1911, the Representation of the People Act 1918, and the Human Rights Act in 1988, all paved the way to an unwritten constitution, but this only gave the illusion that the people had more rights and powers when in reality it was a written constitution that was needed. In 1688, seven aristocratic nobles known as the Immortal Seven, a Whig, a Bishop, an Earl, a Tory, a Captain, a Lord, a Viscount, all attached their names to a letter and invited William of Orange, the current Dutch Stadtholder, to come and be King of England and take over from the current Catholic King James Stuart, who was known as the Tyrant. William arrived at Plymouth, where an English army welcomed his Orange army. The plan was set the people of England knew and wanted it to happen as the laws being imposed on the people and the city of London within the seats of power were being stopped by James' supreme power and changes in laws plus he was a Catholic and this needed to change whereas everyone else was a Protestant apparently William of Orange rode in on a white horse and paraded through the streets and from this moment on Parliament and the people had the power and the monarch was just ceremonial James Stuart was drove out and eventually defeated at the Battle of Boyne, the Vatican no longer had control of the British crown from this day forth, but the aristocracy situated within the city of London did. After the restoration of the crown, James converted to Catholicism and his brother opposed Catholicism and ordered that his daughters be raised as Protestants. Public knowledge of James's faith would only come to light in 1673 when Parliament, fearing a Catholic revolt, created the Test Act of 1673, which required officials to take the an oath of the Church of England. In 1685, Charles Stuart died converting to Catholicism on his deathbed, leaving James to take over as king, but with civil war still in the minds of some people, a peaceful transition of power was needed both now early on and later on in his reign, and Catholicism would only have a short time in power as his heir presumptive Princess Mary was an Anglican and his second wife Mary of Moderna had suffered 10 miscarriages so it didn't look like as if a new Catholic heir would replace Mary to keep the reign going. So then, seven bishops wrote to King James declaring they would not indulge in his declaration as they were unconstitutional and override restrictions as met by parliamentary statute. But James regarded this as a rebellion and had the bishops imprisoned in the Tower of London but they were eventually released and acquitted of their crimes. James then announced he had a son and an heir to the throne but many believed this was not his son, it was an imposter and they had somehow smuggled the child into the bedroom and that's how they made him king. So James had to go really, people were not happy with his reign and like the transition of power at the start of his reign, it seemed there would likely be more problems occurring in the future, which is why the Immortal Seven wrote to the Dutch King asking for his help. And these seven high society members, after they wrote to him, invited him to come over to England, then funded him. But why would they choose a Dutch King for his help? He had a lot going for him. He was already a leader, but most importantly, a Protestant, and he was against Catholicism. So he was high in the line of succession of the English throne, which then could be passed on to many other people so it was a strong claim for the English throne and he was also the stadtholder of the Netherlands so he knew a thing or two already and was a good choice for the uh, seven barons, lords and viscounts and members of society so the ambition was there for him to be king of England. William was also a masterful politician and usually he was always several moves ahead of his competitors like a game of chess but to him this was all about a bigger European problem, big blue block which he saw France as a problem. Louis XIV came out of the French Dutch war as the one of the most powerful people in Europe, an absolute ruler in 
true Catholic style with lots of victories under his belt. So to try to stop this growing power, the Dutch wanted to form an alliance with the English and the Germanic states. William figured that the Dutch Navy couldn't defeat the French alone and definitely not stop the Anglo-French alliance. An Anglo-French alliance would spell certain doom for the Dutch and William saw that alliance as re and something that he had to stop. Then the French and English signed a treaty to form a navy but to counter this alliance William needed to stack everything against the French and he had been trying to lobby and influence the English politicians for over a year now so a letter from the Immortal Seven inviting him to be king was the fruition of his plans and welcomed gladly as he could come not as an invader but as a liberator avoiding a bloody conflict with English forces which would weaken his combined forces later on. He drafted a treaty to the people of the British Isles that he was coming as a liberator, free the houses of parliament and protect the Protestant religion. But he needed two more things before he set sail. He needed Louis to not come to James's rescue and he needed money with which the city of London fronted and in return in 1689 the Quo Warrants Judgment Reverse Act was created to stop the warrant against the City of London Corporation and restore all of the ancient rights and liberties and privileges set forth in the Magna Carta and one of the only three parts of the Magna Carta that is still in use today and all of this followed shortly after the glorious revolution and was all done behind closed doors without any scrutiny or people knowing what was going on. The Germanic states declared war on France so William had his distraction from Louis and the French forces were occupied. He got his approval from the Dutch parliament that a French attack was imminent having captured a lot of the Dutch fleet back from France and so he needed to strike first. So he set sail down the English Channel with 460 63 ships with troops firing cannons and fireworks along the way. William was sending a message of liberation to the English and that the French would be coming to England eventually so he had to liberate England. He arrived at Brixham and began to distribute thousands of copies of his propaganda and as he marched towards London he was only really met with small single deserters or ex-army members whilst James fearing it would further alienate him he fled to France and Parliament took this upon them that he had abdicated the throne and William and Mary were crowned co-regents the first and only time this has happened. Many laws were changed and replaced by the Bill of Rights and no longer could the monarch dictate or change laws ever again they were more ceremonial. Parliament and the House of Lords were installed as well as protection from the church was confirmed. So it was the Dutch in 18... 1581 that established a real constitution, the Plakat van Verletiki, then followed by the Bill of Rights in 1689 and then that also a hundred years later was followed by the Constitution of the United States of America in 1789. But the UK has only had uncodified constitution built on ceremony, royalty, the aristocracy, knights, lords and landowners. But with the Sescovy Act in 1666 all the way up to the glorious revolution in 1688 and various bills and acts following, the city of London took the divine rights of power away from the people and the monarchy giving us a false history and a false glorious revolution. Unlike the vast, vast majority of other countries, the UK does not have a codified constitution. Rather, its constitution is an accumulation, over time, of different documents, precedents and quirks. At its core, the parliament is the highest body. In the words of UCL's constitution unit, this is the ultimate lawmaking power. The UK's constitution comprises of a number of sources, particularly statutes and delegated legislation, made under the authority of parliament, typically by government departments, the royal prerogative, judicial decisions and precedent, the ruling of courts, conventions and international law. Statutes include the likes of constitutionally significant acts passed through parliament, those affecting the relationship between the government and the people, ranging from the Magna Carta to the Parliament Acts, European Communities Act, Human Rights Act and the Fixed Term Parliament Act. The main arguments are around simplicity, transparency, accountability and defined rights. 
An uncodified constitution makes it harder to actually determine what the state of the constitution is and makes it seem to be easier to modify or manipulate it. Instead of having a single defined document, there are a number of documents, unspoken conventions and practices all over the place. Having a codified constitution would allow for the simplification of the vast bank of statutes, case law and convention down to this one single document. With an unwritten constitution, the precise lines that mark out where the power of the executive ends doesn't exist, which means it's ultimately up to the interpretation of the circumstances. And that means there's no defined limit of accountability. Unlike the United States, the UK doesn't have true separation of powers, and instead has a fusion of powers. The legislature, the bit that makes the laws, the executive, the bit that applies the laws, and the judiciary, the bit that supervises that the laws are not distinct. Just taking a look at the House of Commons, we can see the massive overlap between the executive and legislature. Then comes the rights of individuals. Most notably, the rights of individuals in the UK are enshrined in the Human Rights Act of 1998. The issue is that as a piece of primary legislation, Parliament, moreover the government, could technically amend or repeal it. There's no single, unimpeachable document in which individual rights are directly embedded. The uncodified nature of the UK's constitution means that people don't know exactly what the constitution means for them and for their government at any one time. Academics, legal experts and judges are all needed to interpret exactly what anything really means. The argument goes that with a codified constitution, everyone has direct access to what their rights are and what the duties and powers of the executive, judiciary and legislative are, allowing them to call them out or push for further action properly. But whilst flexibility is an issue, for others that's what makes an uncodified constitution preferable. The current constitution is unquestionably complex, then comes the argument of tradition and the practicalities of actually compiling a constitution. There would be immense political and legal difficulty in compiling a constitution that would truly be acceptable to all, bringing together common law precedent and somehow codifying conventions. The UCL Constitution Unit finds 18 constitutional statutes, including the Magna Carta, Parliament's Act, European Communities Act, the Human Rights Act and the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Oxford Constitutional Law finds 14, omitting the Fixed Term Parliament Act, but this was passed after the list was compiled. But the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee in the House of Commons found 28 constitutional statutes, going further and including the likes of the British Nationality Act, the Representation of People Act, the Freedom of Information Act, the Civil Contingencies Act and the Equality Act. An uncodified constitution ultimately allows power to remain in the hands of the democratically elected parliament rather than an unelected judiciary. In a report by the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee, a particular argument presented is that any study of written constitutions around the world shows that they only come into existence after a successful invasion, after a revolution, or some appalling failure in the polity and breakdown in a way that government and politics were operating. The UCL Constitution Unit, in a report discussing the pros and cons of constitution, advocates for status quo for three reasons. Further codification is unlikely to increase transparency. The key pieces of the UK Constitution which are not codified in constitutionally relevant statutes are written in other documents, the primary one being the Cabinet Manual. The second reason is that the codification is unlikely to make interpretation of the constitutional rules easier, and the certainty created by codification is probably overstated. Those drafting the consolidated text simply cannot foresee every possible constitutional problem that could arise in the future. And the third is that the UK's constitutional order functions relatively well without having a codified constitution. The UK is widely recognised as one of the most democratic countries in the world, 